Uh, my name is Goran Kavyedov, uh, and what I'm going to be talking to you about today is um, what have I kind of learned the eight and a half years that I was capacity and performance engineer at Facebook. And as I thought about preparing for um, this session, um, I decided to focus on things that I would consider strategic things. Um, I've given a lot of presentations in the past about uh, what I would consider tactical things. So, uh, you know, how to implement something, how to do a test, how to do this and that. Uh, but I am now reflecting back on, you know, what are, what are the big takeaways take of uh, the stuff that I've learned in the basically 20 plus year of, uh, of my career. And so there will be three themes that I'll discuss over here. And I believe that uh, they are all uh, really strategic as opposed to tactical. Theme number one will be build what you need when you need it or buy when you don't have to build things or uh, stay inside your, um, your abilities and your core competence. Uh, team two will be it's all about data. Uh, if you want to run things at the size of billions of users, um, you really, really have to kind of have an easy access to data. You have to know what to collect uh, and you have to know how to actually do it correctly. And then finally, because I, I did spend the last couple of years of my time at Facebook as being a purely capacity engineer, um, you know, I'd like to talk about, uh, you know, three ways to manage capacity, although technically there is four, and so we'll get to that as well. Um, before I start, I do want to give you a little bit of my background because um, I am certainly an opinionated person that comes with a lot of biases, uh, and I do want to mention some of those up front. So I started uh, at Facebook in 2010, um, I moved it to Facebook once they started working on hip hop, uh, which will be mentioned later in the presentation. And so, uh, you know, when I when I saw like, hey, why are you working on this compiler for um, for PHP? I was like, okay, th these guys are starting to get serious about performance. Uh, I was not happy at Google, uh, and so I made the jump. I did a lot of performance work before. Uh, I've never done any capacity work because fundamentally at, at Google, the approach was just build and buy as many data centers and who cares about capacity, they'll just fill it up with top of the line machines. Um, and uh, during my interview, uh, I kid you not, they were like, you know, because I was concerned, I was like, okay, performance, I'm comfortable, I'll do that, but you know, I've never done any capacity work, so you guys should know what you're getting. And uh, my uh, long-term boss turns out to you know, the person who ended up being my boss said, like, well, can you do spreadsheets? Uh, and I was like, what? And he goes, well, you know, Excel. And I'm like, well, yeah, of course I can do Excel. I mean, who can't do Excel? Oh, don't worry about capacity then. Um, it ended up being slightly different than that, but it's okay. Uh, I am a Unix and C person. Um, actually, I am a Unix and C bigot. <laughs> and, um, you know, we can argue about it, but you're wrong, I'm right. It's the best way to go. So let's not even go there. Um, my uh, performance work has almost always been focused on server side. Primarily reason uh, is I control servers, I know what's running on them, I know what is going on, uh, trying to figure out what somebody is running on their device and what they did yesterday, um, simply not what I wanted to spend my time on. And um, the two people who I was the fourth person hired, the fourth performance engineer, um, and uh, two of them uh, ended up getting management um, and ended up being uh, basically, I ended up working for the two of them, which was a great experience. But basically from 2011, 12, somewhere in there is when, uh, when Bill also transitioned to management. Till 2019, I was the lead of capacity engineering and I was kind of the person that made the decision. Uh, I also want to make very clear that I never managed Corp Eng. Uh, these are the guys who handle your uh, Oracle and your Microsoft and whatever. And it was, I, to call them a three ring circus would be really insulting to circus. Uh, so I've never, I mean, I, I technically yelled at them frequently, but that was not the core of my job. All my work was in production. Uh, it has been two years. So some things have certainly changed. And as you are about to find out, I am very definitely neither a PowerPoint nor a keynote expert. Uh, I'd like to thank whoever is the kind person that created the template 
um, because without it, this would all be white slides with bulleted lists. So uh, the first theme, um, build what you need when you need it. I currently advise and give suggestions to a number of startups and people trying to you know, come up with their own ideas. And frequently they go like, okay, well, you know how Facebook built its own infrastructure. We are thinking of building our own cola. And uh, my first reaction is roll my eyes and go like, is there a reason why you cannot go to a public cloud? I don't care which one. I don't care whether it's Amazon, whether it's Google, whether it's Azure, Microsoft, go to the public cloud. Um, basically stick to your core competence. Once you're successful, once you have a lot of money, then you can start looking at some other things. But in general, Always, always, always stick to your core competence. And so I'm going to give four examples here. One is going to be open compute, the one that I kind of like the most. Uh, the other one is going to be the progression from PHP to hip hop to HHVM. Um, I'll probably just skip over RocksDB because I have a lot of stuff to talk about. And then the fourth one is going to be a counterexample. Most of the presentation will be focused on things that went well that I believe people can learn from and benefit. I mean, we can all meet one time and talk about all the things that went poorly. I'm sure everybody has a ton of stories about it, so I'm just going to give some, not so much to crap on the people who were involved, but mostly to point out what were the mistakes that were done. So to me, Open Compute was uh, just really well done and executed by Facebook. For those who don't know, Facebook is the company that open sourced all of its hardware. And so opencompute.org is basically an effort to do for hardware what was already done for software with all of the open source software initiatives. Um, all of the servers, uh, all of the data centers, power designs, network design, whatever you want, it's available on open compute. But how was it done? At the point in time, I joined Facebook August 2010, and at that point in time, they've already started working on it. So uh, the core people, the key people have already been hired. But basically in 2008, 2009, Facebook quickly realized it's growing. It is um, uh, certainly looking like it's going to be uh, quite a successful company. And what they needed to do is create a source for all of their machines that isn't the two suppliers that they were using at the time. Um, they were not exactly happy with either the price or the quality, doesn't matter, but they decided we will build our own data centers and we'll build our own servers. And so the first step stop um, of that journey was develop core competency, right? This wasn't Facebook's core competency. And so what they did, and they first hired the right people and they gave them the open hands to actually execute on this. Um, this happened before my arrival, but uh, from August 2010, uh, the plan was let's start slowly. So in 2011, Facebook actually builds its first data center in Prineville, uh, Oregon. And in that first data center, we put for the first time uh, Facebook's compute servers, right? They were designed and built by Facebook, but why compute servers? Well, because compute servers were easy. And so the idea was like, okay, let's pick something that is relatively easy and then uh, get that done. And so in 2011, we started running our own compute servers, and there were three different kinds of those at the time. Eventually, uh, they ended up being only two, but it was uh, two compute servers based on, uh, on Intel board. Um, one was high memory, high uh, speed, high processing power. The other one was small memory, small, uh, sorry, high processing power. And then there was an AMD-based um, a uh, model that was high memory but very low processing power that was caching, cache machine. And immediately Facebook focuses and starts doing like, okay, we want multiple vendors for all the components so that if something happens badly here or there, we can uh, pivot quickly, which of course isn't all that easy uh, at the time because you really have only Intel and AMD uh, as chip manufacturers. And for a period of time after that, AMD was not very competitive. So then the year after, the company again goes uh, slowly on expanding its competence. And so now we're building second data center on the east coast of the United States. And this time we're adding storage servers, two different kinds of storage servers. Think of it as one uh, is for Hadoop, basically for uh, processing pipelines and so on. So it has a lot of memory, it has a lot of disk. And the other one is for blob storage, but it's mostly the time used for photos. So uh, a lot of disk, but not a lot of power. 
you go on uh, and the year after that, uh, the first international data center is built in Lulia uh, in Sweden. And uh, at that point in time, for the first time, Facebook builds its own database servers, right? Uh, every single year that um, something is done, the previous efforts are also completely refurbished and redone based on a new chipset. So at the point in time when Intel gives us a new chipset, you know, we already redo the servers that, um, you know, that were built previously. Uh, so in, uh, in step four, in basically the third year, we are already redoing servers for uh, storage. We are already redoing servers for compute once or twice, and for the first time doing database servers. And uh, from then on, you just keep kind of rinse and repeat. Um, you keep adding uh, data centers and expanding data centers all the time. Um, you keep uh, adding new things. Uh, as soon as you realize that the Cisco switches that you are using on clusters uh, are having problems and that Cisco is not willing to address those problems, not to crap on Cisco, um, that was a really bad move on their part. But, you know, they, they had to look and say, hey, here we have this problem that is reported only by Google and Facebook. Uh, and then we have all of these other customers all of our banks and you know financial institutions and healthcare institutions and so on, and then none of them will ever um, encounter this problem. Do we actually go and there is um, you know this table is in code base and they basically decided not to do that, which kind of uh, forced us to uh, to create our own top of rack switches, and then pretty soon after that we kind of reimagined the whole um, the whole network and uh you know open sourced all of those things so in the long run i i think it was a bad decision for Cisco, but you know it was their decision to make um what i liked about this approach was again you they didn't start with this idea of like well how hard can it be to build servers and data centers i mean come on people are doing it instead they went out they find the right people they bring them to facebook they uh really empower them to do the right thing and then they start slowly, one thing at a time. Everything is planned, everything is coordinated, everybody knows what is going on. Um, similar example now from the, from the uh, basically software world, right? Um, I am probably the person that despises PHP more than anybody else because I kind of had to deal with it at Facebook. Um, and, uh, but, it is difficult to argue that it was a bad choice at the time when, you know, Mark and, uh, you know, the three other founders decided to build all of this stuff. It allowed them to quickly iterate, it allowed them to quickly grow, move things around, add features at no time. It is incredibly poorly performing tool. However, they weren't focusing on that. And they focused on how quickly can the developers develop. So um, they started with the tool that, basically allow them for quick iteration that, in a sense, set them up to be successful. Um, once they were successful, they continued with fast iterations. They grew and grew and grew, and they started solving performance problems only when needed, right? So it starts with one developer realizing, geez, here is this one little routine inside PHP that we call all the time. What could happen if I were to recompile this in C++? And then he gains huge performance gains doing that. And so that just kind of quickly starts the idea for hip hop and we start developing hip hop. Uh, and while this is going on, somebody realizes, you know, this is, this is great effort, but we are growing fast and this is not going to be enough. And so Facebook starts a parallel effort um, of, uh, of a new tool, HHVM, basically uh, uh, VM. Uh, for all of the developers who are writing front-end code in PHP. And uh, I really think that this is another one of the projects that was done really, really well. Uh, in particular, what I was impressed by uh, was that the company recognized there is a huge human cost associated with parallel development. And what I mean by that is not that, you know, engineers are that expensive. Yeah, they are. but you are now asking five or 10 people to work on something that very clearly will be tossed away if the other project um, pans out and everybody kind of knows that the other project will pan out. 
right? So for a couple of years, hip hop and HHVM are basically running in parallel with the idea that HHVM still needs to grow, get better, fix some issues, and eventually it beats hip hop completely out of the water. And everybody knows that. But during this time, you are still expecting and asking people to work on this basically soon to be that project. You have to reward them, you have to recognize them, and you, you have to understand that there is going to be a cost with that. And I think Facebook did a phenomenal job with that. The third one, if you haven't heard, uh, same thing, RocksDB, uh, there was no need to, uh, to kind of hire competence. I would argue that when it comes to MySQL, no other company um, can compete with the competence and the skill set that Facebook had. However, the database itself was growing. Um, we used to joke that Facebook is not in the business uh, of, of large data. We are basically in the business of lots of small data because fundamentally our, our MySQL was kind of like a key value store, almost not exactly, but close, close enough. Um, and uh, at some point in time, it looked like, again, storage was going to be a problem. Uh, this happened roughly at the same time that strategically we were looking going forward suddenly we are not going to need all of this compute on our database servers because we are putting a really nice right to, through cache in front of it. So, hey, is there something we can do because we now have access compute that we can somehow use that access compute to reduce the storage and of course compression immediately comes to mind. Another super nice effort. Um, where I think it's, again, all of it is open source, um, and there is far more qualified papers written and presentations given about it if you're interested in details. The final one, uh, sorry, the final example that I want to address is the, the one um, that I feel like we did a terrible job. It's called Tupperware. It was going to be uh, a general virtualization for, um, for running Facebook processes and jobs, so basically, Think about VMware kind of job. And it started with this bunch of relatively young engineers and the, the famous last words that anybody ever heard, which is like, well, how hard can it be? Um, and then when you add to that certain amount of uh, confidence that isn't necessarily warranted, uh, and you uh, dismiss any suggestions from the actual VMware engineers that were hired and were working on different projects where people try tell like, well, maybe you shouldn't be doing this, but you know better, you quickly end up with a solution that pretty much everybody despises, and now you have to beat people into using the solution. And a lot of times you don't even understand um, what is the problem that people actually have and why they are rejecting your solution in the first place. Uh, and so I would say, even in a company that has kind of figured out with a number of projects how to do some things right, uh, there is certainly no shortage of the times when things were done poorly, but I would prefer on uh, to focus on the things that worked and to basically tell you why I think it works. So develop competence, um, go iteratively, focus on small pieces, and then keep um, moving forward on that. Uh, and I think that is the only way you can be successful in the long run. Theme number two is it's all about data. Uh, I've given performance presentations before about um, how we dealt with this, uh, and I'll give some of the information in this. I'm happy to answer questions. So fundamentally, if you are starting a discussion about which data should be collected, you're on the wrong track. Uh, that is certainly a discussion that will end up nowhere, and uh, it can never reach the correct conclusion. So instead, focus on uh, something else, focus on making it trivial to collect all of data. And uh, again, my pet peeve and, uh, and my uh, being my bigot uh, comes to play here. I believe that Unix approach is the only right approach over here. Treat everything as a small self-contained unit, a daemon that is running on your servers. Uh, make them relatively simple. Make them easy to uh, you know, collect the data from and so on. And uh, if you need to, you can also string multiples of them, but basically Unix approach will win every single time over everything else that you may want to do. And the only warning that I will um, add over here is that once you have all of this data, and because the data is phenomenal and you can debug quickly, 
you should never allow people to use it as an excuse and a cop out for doing, uh, you know, basically doing the right thing when writing code. Uh, arriving and running decent unit tests and fixing things, it's like, well, you know, if it goes wrong, I should be able to pick it up, you know, in uh, in my pipelines very quickly is, uh, is a terrible attitude to have. So, as I said, collect all data. Um, Unix daemons make them extremely lightweight. They, in my opinion, they should be written. Uh, your mileage may vary. Keep in mind if these daemons are running on all of the machines and if they're using more than 1% of all of your resources, that is a huge waste if you're running millions of servers, right? Um, and uh, the daemon should be responsible only for one thing, and that is to gather the data it was meant to gather. Of course, also, you want to make it available to anybody who asks for it. And so basically, on all of our servers, uh, we have three different little uh, independent daemons that were fairly lightweight. They were costing about 1% of CPU. And uh, the one that I was maintaining and I was responsible for was called Dino. By the end, it was collecting about 200, 250 per second uh, measurements of the machine that it was sitting on. And uh, if a particular process that was running on it, product in particular, um, wanted us to do that, we could also collect any number of uh, per second data points that they were interested in. So ads would have their own extensions, uh, newsfeed would have their own extension, you know, database would have their own extensions and so on. And the only thing that Dyna would do is it was just sitting there constantly keeping about 120 seconds of all of this stuff in memory. And then if somebody connected to port 1777 uh, and asked for the data, it would just shove it out that port. That's it, the only thing it does. The other daemon that we have running on these machines is running top every 10 seconds, so six times a minute. Same thing, it runs top and again shoves it to a particular pipe and you know it's being sucked somewhere else and the data is processed. And the third daemon is actually the most interesting one. That one uh, wakes up every minute and um, rolls dice, depending on how many machines are running this exact same uh, code and place source. Um, the, the dice may be different size, but it decides, do I crash this machine right now? And if I decide to crash the machine, I crash the machine, I collect the core file, I analyze and get all of the stack traces, and again, ship that off to somebody else who can analyze all of the data later on. Now, notice that the demons don't do any analysis. For one, each one is writing, sitting on um, an individual machine, and so what you want is you want to collect the data from thousands, ten thousands, or you know, in some cases, even more of those first. And the second thing is, I don't want this super lean code to be burdened with anything else. So instead, we would write independent listeners and have them extract whatever information we wanted and then uh, do whatever is necessary with that information. Now, what does that allow you to do? Um, by the time I left, Facebook was running performance tests on all of the environments basically all the time. It didn't matter uh, you know, which particular cluster and which particular data center you went to. There were live performance tests running on all of those environments. Uh, and we knew exactly how many more users, front-end users we could bring up. We knew how things looked from any of the services in the background. Pretty much knew everything that could be done there. Um, additionally, what you can do now, you can decide to uh, basically shift your network traffic and load up a particular data center or a particular region or a, a particular, obviously, cluster and so on and then figure out you know, how this is going to perform. You can do performance, service performance and load tests for individual services, no problem. As I said, more, more importantly, you can now do large scale performance tests. You can do data centers performance tests. You can go do the whole region performance tests. And um, why would you want to do this? Uh, so I remember in 2014 or maybe 2015, um, you know, somebody from the U.S. can correct me, East Coast was going to get hit with a really terrible, terrible cold wave. Um, and what we did is we basically turned down our data center in Forest City, North Carolina, and released that power to the state. 
I strongly suspect, I have no information because I, you know, I'm no longer on the inside. I strongly suspect that during the last um, performance freeze in, uh, sorry, the last freeze in uh, Texas, the same thing was done with Fort Worth data center. Because we know that we can load other data centers a little bit more, when you have an opportunity to do the right thing, like release the power that you're using, as you can imagine, these data centers are huge. Uh, you know, they are, they are 30 megawatts. You may have five of them in a region. You may have more. Uh, if you can give that power back to the state, even though you have the guarantees, and they can actually heat, um, you know, and help people heat their homes, it, it's simply the right thing to do. And because you're collecting this data and because you made it easy to collect, you now don't have this problem at all. All of this is completely possible right now. So, 100% uh, uh, believe that this should be done. And uh, now for the final thing, as I said, uh, capacity, it didn't turn out to be um, what I was told, like, oh, well, you know, we'll, uh, we'll just do this in a spreadsheet. And, and to be fair, in the beginning when I joined, so I am joining Facebook in 2010, and my first job and how I learned capacity was because my, uh, my boss comes to me and says, well, you know, we have to decommission and get out of this uh, small colo in San Francisco. And uh, the code name was SF2P because uh, it was, if there is a data center on 200 Powell in San Francisco, and we were just using some space in the data center. And uh, at this point in time, Facebook already has data centers in Santa Clara, and it already has data centers, all um, colo data centers, they are leasing data centers from different providers. So in Santa Clara and uh, on the East Coast in Ashburn, which for all practical purposes is uh, Washington, D.C. Um, and, uh, and I'm told, like, okay, so here's your first job, right? I have some performance tasks, which is not a problem at all. Um, but, you know, I need to turn down this call. And, um, you know, you just kind of first question is, like, well, first of all, what is in there? Second thing is, what is running on those machines? Third thing is, hey, where can I move them and, and where can I put these people and where's the right place for them to live? And then you go ahead and start doing these things. And from there, um, I basically learned how to do capacity. And uh, so I'll tell you about the three ways um, because as the time went on, I, I was called to do capacity talks and collaborate with the a number of different companies in the Bay Area, you know, we share the information, we, um, we get along. And so I've learned that there is really four different ways. One is centrally. And for as long as I was at Facebook, we've, we've managed our capacity centrally. Uh, again, my personal preferred way, I think that's, again, the right way to do it. Uh, because if I didn't feel that way, obviously, uh, I, wouldn't have, uh, I wouldn't have been doing it for, for like eight years like that. Uh, the most common approach is what I'm sure most of you have seen is where every team has their own budget. And I would say pretty much sooner or later, every company will settle on that particular approach. Now, I've never seen anybody manage uh, a different constraint until one of the fairly large uh, local companies with headquarters, again, in the Silicon Valley, called me for a talk, and we are talking about this, and they have these performance engineers and capacity engineers, and I find out that what they're really managing is power. And so if I am a part of their search team, I have, I don't know, two megawatts. And, uh, you know, I can do with those two megawatts whatever I want. And it was an interesting approach, so I'm going to talk about that. And the final is the fourth approach where you are not really managing. Nobody is managing and, uh, you know, unmanaged capacity is still a way of basically getting things done. So let's talk about advantages of managing centrally. Um, managing centrally, you need to have the right people to do it. And the right people, not just from the perspective of somebody willing to understand the technical challenges and so on, but, uh, but somebody willing to really understand also people and politics. And that was my boss, Bill. Bill was, I, I frequently saw him at work and I, I felt like I was, you know, watching Yoda because he could get people to do what he wanted better than any other person ever. And, and he did it very pleasantly and with a smile, and it was just amazing. Uh, my approach was more of a bulldozer approach, which also works when you all own the machine. 
So uh, my, my um, trade-off and my uh, message to the company was, I'll manage your capacity, but that means I own it. And that means I make all the decisions. You, developers, uh, VPs, I don't care who you are, you definitely have the right to challenge all of my decisions. Uh, you can provide more data, you can prove to me that I'm wrong, and I'm willing to listen to you, but you cannot overrule me without providing these things. And so basically, you, you must have a few people willing to hold the line. Um, I joked at some point in time that I was probably the most hated person at, uh, at Facebook engineering, but you know, uh, I'm from the Balkans, so I sort of tend to thrive on hate. It didn't bother me at all. Uh, and uh, very quickly, I also realized that because the management, people management aspects of work were kind of messed up, I could turn it to, to my benefit. And so um, uh, Facebook would have these performance reviews twice a year. And I knew that you know in June and in December, people will want to launch their products. They're probably going to screw things up. They're probably going to need more um, machines from me. I would offer to give them those machines if they promise to fix their performance mistakes later on and they owe me a favor down the road. Uh, it worked beautifully, right? People were actually quite happy to work with you on that. And the fundamental thing is you have to be honest. Uh, I was always incredibly honest with people and I would tell them like, look, I actually don't care about your you know, product, your app, your or so on. For me, the, the line of priority is very simple. It's newsfeed followed by ads, you know, followed by, and, and database of course is in front of everything else. Um, eventually it became Instagram somewhere there in the top. You have to be honest with people. Look, I have no hard feelings against any of you. I only like the people who pay my paycheck. And so uh, if you're honest with people, they may not like the decision, but they were actually quite okay with it. It's like, hey, do you want to get your paycheck? Do you want to see the stock uh, go up? Or do you want me to give you the machine? Your choice. And most of the times people would be very reasonable. However, from what I understand, even Facebook has moved towards the budget-based situation. Now, um, in budget-based situation, I will discuss uh, what are the advantages because the disadvantages are so many that you know, we would need a whole other session for it, and I'm also sure that all of you have seen it. Um, the advantages are that pretty much everybody understands, hey, there's no money. Uh, we've spent all of our budget, so you have to wait. And if any individual team really messes up, their, their mess up is contained within their budget. And so it doesn't impact anybody else. That is nice. The, as I said, the problems, millions. People are incentivized to spend the money that they don't need to spend because if they give it back, then I, am I going to get that money next quarter? Uh, people are incentivized not to like trade with everybody else and basically not be a team. Uh, because there is no point in collaborating with each other. And so while I understand that every company settles on this, uh, for as long as you can, please don't go this route. Um, managing some other resource, power being the only one that I have seen, clearly, clearly can get done. This was a large company that I'm talking about. They were managing power. Uh, it was sort of surprising to me, but you know, after talking with their performance and their capacity engineers, they basically said, Money was not necessarily the object, and so if you wanted to add more machines, you would just buy the machines that would do more work uh, you know, for less power, buy them, put them in the data center, and now you could do uh, actually more work. Um, my personal suspicion is that it can only work when the company is already in the steady state or in a slow growth or obviously fine. Uh, in this particular case, the company uh, was certainly, I think, in, a, in steady state or slow growth. I think it would be very difficult to, um, to hold developers uh, kind of constrained by how much power they can have. Uh, but I have, seen, uh, I have seen it work, and I think it can work for extended period of time. Uh, and the fourth approach is uh, unmanaged. And I think it is probably the right approach for uh, for early startups. You know, you basically buy your gear or you buy instances when the budget allows for it. Uh, I will again um, sort of go back to thing number one. Don't try to develop your own gear. Don't, you know, develop your own, you know, colo space or anything else unless you have to. Uh, so, for example, I, I know a startup that I'm closely affiliated with, and so they are, 
Uh, they need to acquire the TV signal in different areas of the United States, so they don't have a choice. They have to go to Ocala, uh, and they have to put antennas on the roof, and they have to acquire the signal. So in which case, yeah, you should go ahead and, and use Ocala. But if you don't have something like that, just go with Amazon, go with Google, go with, uh, go with Microsoft. Um, it allows you for very quick expansion. It allows you for, to quickly shrink things, turn things down when you don't need them. I think that is incredibly important. Not to mention, you don't really have an expertise in these spaces. So, so trust the people that are actually providing this as a service and focus on what is it that you're trying to provide and build. Um, Part of the problem with this, uh, this works early on because early on you have small teams and most of the people can agree on the same priorities and same, you know, cause uh, to move forward and so on uh, for as long as they have, um, you know, th there's few of them. Uh, once you have 10,000 people, I don't think this can work. I, I don't think it can work more than for more than 50 people. And so you basically let people grab what they need. Um, and at the end, you kind of uh, require them to justify and count what they were using. And I'll say that during my first couple of years at Google, uh, this was kind of how it worked because um, Google had uh, so many resources that they could buy data centers all around the world and, uh, and just put the machines in them. And there was no need to, um, to sort of monitor too closely. And the only time I think over there when we started really caring about performance was when we ran out of uh, space everywhere in the world and we didn't any more machines. Um, as a person who did some auditing and reclaiming, uh, it's heartbreaking to see the amounts of waste from, um, you know, from the intern who left last summer and left 300 processes running on 300 machines that nobody is looking and nobody is paying attention to, to, uh, you know, some um, people starting processing and the machines are crashing maybe, I don't know, 50 to five times an hour. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's just, I don't know, it goes against every grain, uh, you know, or everything I stand for, but I also will agree that it's probably the right approach in early stages. Um, and so given that, I am actually on time and uh, I'd be happy to open it to questions, and hopefully I'll give you answers. Thank you so much. I mean, it's, uh, I, uh, it was a really, really, really interested. interesting. Interesting. Uh, was because um, you were uh, you were uh, sharing your experience, and it was so interesting. Uh, uh, so were we. So I, I was. I didn't know all the stories that you were referring to for sure. But uh, it was funny because you you mentioned the uh, data center Lumia in Sweden. Uh, yes, in Sweden, um, our first international data center. Love the place. Ah, you've been there, so often. Oh, yeah, a, a friend of mine was the was part of the RFC uh, RFP uh, for the location. So um, the Lumia had a lot of advantage uh, in terms of cooling, in terms of uh, powering, in terms of stuff. So uh, it was great. I mean, we were so happy when when Facebook uh, decided to set up there. Uh, it was a great story, and and I didn't have the the other part of the story as you just uh, explained. So that was just uh, wonderful. Uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, your presentation. To be honest, uh, it was great. Thank you so much for sharing Thank the experience. Um, if I can, if I can suggest to people, I'll give a plug for open because some things that Facebook did there are absolutely fantastic. Right? When you look at the, the, how little power is wasted in Facebook, they, they've redesigned the machines, so, so basically they're running at 277 volts, uh, which is you know, basically the whole ACDC conversion way to not lose any power. There is no uh, cooling in the data centers that isn't um, evaporative cooling. Right, so suddenly you are not running AC, tremendous amount of power saved. As you mentioned, Lulia was cho chosen because for multiple reasons. Um, accessibility of clean energy, Lulia had a lot of uh, hydroelectric power, but also not only was it cold, it isn't enough for it to be cold. Lulia is cold and dry. Unlike Stockholm, which is cold and wet, or Malmo, which is cold and wet, Lulia is cold and dry, and that is 
truly a dream location for data centers. So it's not surprising that others have followed in those areas. But um, but yeah, I loved uh, I loved uh, just visiting there. It was a great location. Have you used USL University Scarbetti Low in your work? Uh, no. Now, uh, so as far as I'm concerned, and I've come to believe this, uh, we just basically use live traffic. I mean, you could do some performance tests on the side using fake loads and so on, but we always use live, live traffic. Um, and uh, you just shift more traffic on a city. And to give you an example of what we did in every, and as a matter of fact, they're doing right now, there is no question in my mind that it hasn't changed. In every data center, um, in front end clusters, so the so the clusters that are basically running web servers and receive, receiving client requests, there is going to be two racks of machines running at what we would consider 80% load. Um, there's going to be two racks of machines running, uh, and so that's 40 machines per rack. So 80 machines running at 80% load, uh, 80 machines running at 20% load, and we will extrapolate what is the total load curve. And so at every point in time. We know how much more traffic can the data center take. And you will randomly go to whatever cluster is relatively close to you, and sometimes you will hit those servers and you will never know. Uh, but basically, we will get the readings of how quickly. And when I say 80% load, that was another thing that Facebook did uh, uh, differently. Facebook defined the load, unlike what I did at Google, they basically looked at what is the delay that Linux adds, the Linux scheduler adds a delay before your request is processed. If that request is 100 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, so if from the point in time the scheduler said this is ready to go and the processor took it, right, it's 100 milliseconds, Facebook said this machine is loaded to its maximums and should not be loaded anymore. And so what we would do is we would constantly monitor these sets of machines was loaded to 80 milliseconds. We tried to keep it at 80 milliseconds, schedule or induce delay. The other set was loaded to 20 milliseconds, schedule or induce delay. And you're picking up this data on a second basis. Obviously, they're not going to be exactly 80 milliseconds and exactly 20. And so you create a curve that tells you what is happening at 100, 80, 60, 40, 20, and zero. What is fascinating when you have that curve is to see how little difference is between zero and 100. You can maybe handle one or two extra users, and, and you are basically starting to slow people down. Um, and, uh, and so to me, that was just such an incredible, uh, it took some guts to do that, but man, that turned out to be one of the stepping stones to basically having full control of live load tests everywhere. Now, I also have a ton of, you know, stories of what happens if you decide to run your load test on a, on a cache server, right? And you just happen to unfortunately pick a time early on, this happened uh, in 2011 or 2012, we picked a time in the evening to basically put a lot more load on cache servers and to see how they're responding and people are, are live going on and it just overlapped with the point in time when Justin Bieber to, got his haircut and loaded up a picture. And suddenly, several of our cache servers start basically exploding. And the cache team is yelling, you know, stop the test, stop the test, slow down. And we are like, okay, we are stopping the test, load this down. And these ser servers are really just, you know, straining and barely. And so we spin additional instances automatically, but it's like, what is going on? Uh, one of the database guys immediately looks at it and goes like, wait, this is a brand new UID, you know, what, what is this, you know, sorry, FBID, and they look it up and it's like Justin Bieber picture. <laughs> Uploaded every single girl from, you know, 12 to, I don't know, you know, up to and including 75 had to see that picture at that point in time and make a comment on it. And, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that is hilarious. And you just go like, okay, guys, calling the test over. Good luck, Cash. Uh, you know, let us know if you need anything. And we'll just get back to this, uh, you know, two days from now. But you can do all of this as well.
there's another question from the audience. Uh, so uh, it says, the question is, what resources would you recommend on capacity planning topic? Uh, so that's an interesting question. Uh, I kind of had to learn things from scratch. And so unlike performance, where I have sort of a list of books that I really, really like, uh, I actually, unfortunately, don't have a good recommendation for capacity. There is a number of books out there. I think they are all valid. I would, uh, I would grab them all uh, and read through. But overall, because the environments are so different, you know, uh, how you plan in a public cloud is so different from how you plan in a private cloud. How do you plan in, uh, so I will tell you one of the things that we did, for example, because I had my private cloud. At the point in time, I had five regions. Um, you know, so let's say, so that was, I had Prineville, I had Forest City, I had Lulio, I have Dallas Fort Worth, and then I have, uh, is, Planta, what comes after that, or maybe Odensa or Clooney, I, I don't, you know, you kind of lose track of them. But, but let's say I have five regions around the world. I basically told my developers that I'm going to give them 25% of the capacity that they need to support absolute 100% maximum traffic that they will have in the next six months. I'm going to give them 25% in every region. So if any region goes down, they don't get any kind of excuse because they still have 24, 5% in four regions, right? So that was one of the things that we have done. And the idea was we will always do this. Well, it turns out that once you start having 10 regions or 12 regions, this is not the smartest approach. It is great for 45 because you start losing, because at that point in time, the overhead of maintaining all of the code in all of the regions Overhead that you're putting on, in our case, production engineers and also on uh, on the developers themselves, end up, ends up being more than what you are actually extracting from, you know, having like an extra two or three percent that you save, right? And so for me, it was an interesting thing um, that um, that basically you. Um, you know, you feel like this is the right thing, this is how we should manage, and then you grow into this different stage where once you have two billion users, the stuff that you did when you had 250 million simply doesn't apply, you know? Uh, same as building our own network switch, top of rack, or the large switch uh, in 2012 would have been sheer insanity. Like, why would you do that? That is stupid. Leave it to Cisco, you know, leave it to Juniper, leave it to everybody else. But in 2015, 2016, when when Cisco switch causes me to lose, you know, my my cluster every so often, just because one of the top of rack switch has been overwhelmed, instead of just shutting that rack and ignoring it, the core cluster switch goes haywire. At that point in time, I have to put in my own solution, and that may be, you know, rate limiting all of my racks or building a better switch. And I think building a better switch is simply a better solution at that point in time. Um, so, um, you know, it's, uh, I will say, it's been the most amazing eight and a half years of my life, uh, preceded with five years at, at Google as well. But seeing how things work at this scale, and it also taught me that being angry at people, so, you know, just a side plug for everybody over here, if you are angry at how governments are handling vaccinations with COVID, which there is a lot of anger over here. I actually am not that angry because I, I certainly have an appreciation for the level of difficulty of rolling something that they have not been prepared and trained. And I don't know what the situation is in all of your countries, but in the one that I'm currently in, both California and the U.S., it's not like the, the, the best and the brightest go and say, let me go for a government job. So I really feel for those people. I actually think they're doing as well as they could possibly, you know, it's very easy for me to sit from my position over here or my colleagues from, you know, Google and Facebook with unlimited budgets and millions of machines to go like, well, this should have been done in a much better organization, you know, I mean, how big of a deal is uh, to have 300 million people registered and described all parameters? Well, 
you know, for government, it actually is a big deal. And it's, it's easy to be snide and obnoxious. Um, the last question from the audience. It's, uh, do you still use R? So it's Scott Stevens is asking yes. that. Holy crap, yes. yes. I love that thing. R is like, like math lab on steroids. It's better. It's fantastic. A great plug for R is if you do nothing else, soak up all the data in the R because R is smart enough like that. Just soak up a whole ton of data and then say plot and give the variable that, you know, plot in parentheses data. Presumably you've soaked up the stuff in data. And R will plot every column versus every other column and you look at that stuff and if you're stuck and you can't see anything else, I will bet you nine times out of 10, you will see something there that goes like, wait, why is this looking like that? And you start digging into it and you find problems uh, and so on. But yeah, I love R. I think R is fantastic. Yeah, so I would, I would highlight, not to mention again, open source, um, I, a huge fan of open source, if you couldn't tell by now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Garanka. It was a really uh, interesting. Uh, it was like a, watching a movie for me, uh, to be honest. <laughs> oh. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you know, thanks for inviting me. Uh, truly a pleasure. Uh, didn't know about this and thoroughly enjoying the whole thing. And it's kind of nice to see some of the uh, some of the old criminals in that. You know, we we all know each other, right? We we know what crimes we are guilty of, and uh, you know, and where they were committed and stuff at all the conferences and so on. It's absolutely lovely to meet all. You know, and to see all of the people I know. So 